This podcast contains explicit content and is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Don't say we didn't warn you. Hello and welcome. My name is Madison. And I'm Hannah. And you are listening to Who's Knocking? Yet another true crime podcast. Yet another. So right. here we are, back with another episode. Madison um, is basically about to go into labor, <laughs> but we're still bringing you this episode. <laughs> yeah, brought to you by extremely pregnant woman. I feel like I'm going to have a baby any minute now. Okay. Hopefully we'll make it through this episode. I think this will be on the shorter end. I kind of hope you have it mid-podcast, but yeah. I mean, that'd be pretty cool. I mean, I think if anything, yeah. it, it, I won't have it, but like maybe I'll, my water will break. Who knows? It has right. happened twice before, which is not common. Yeah, that would be exciting. Yeah, I can. I, I've definitely felt the the fetus descend today. So it's making its way down the pelvic region. That is really exciting, honestly. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Podcast, uh, baby. Yeah. Our little who's knocking the <laughs> Do you have any any true crime news this week? I don't know if I've heard any news. Have you? Not really, but I was I did um I was thinking about something today. Um, well, in the last few days, but I've been thinking a lot about like every time I go to my garbage shoot, I think oh, about God. Phoebe Hanscheck. Yeah, how could you not? And I was remembering that when I was doing my research, um, Phoebe's mother and grandfather were looking into the idea. Like, they're like, okay, has this situation happened to anybody else before? Like, is people falling down garbage? No, people falling down garbage shoots and like they just want to know what happened in these situations. Okay. And they found, they only mentioned two instances, but I found actually a couple more. Um, But it turned. In this Hall. has happened. Yeah, it's actually it actually happened in Toronto. Um, kind of recently, I think like 2018, at a so scary what at Eglinton fuck? and Mount Pleasant. And oh, my friend lives near there. What if it was in their building? It's, there's a lot of high rise buildings. <laughs> at, I'm so yeah. I Eglinton. just assume it's like at the place I know. But right. yeah, who knows? But there's one instance that is, or two instances that is really interesting or just like really suspect, I think. Okay. Um, and it, it's in Baltimore. Okay. There's one building that two people have gone head first down the garbage chute one year apart, and there's been no explanation about either. That's really weird. And they deemed them suicides? They haven't determined. Oh, can know. they just do that? And like the all these people in the building are like, what happened? Like, is there a serial yeah. killer? Like, is what? that gonna happen to me? Like, how has this happened to two people when you're apart? And um, it's just been like super sketchy. And there's no, it's like after it happens the first time, like put a security camera in there. Yeah. Um, and it's all and like there's it's happened in a number of other places too. I think that I was just there was one in Calgary as well. And all these people, I think a lot of them um were like had drugs and alcohol situations yeah. or whatever. Um, but they don't or like, you know, people who who think they're gonna like slide down and end up in the garbage because in movies and stuff that happens. So that's like people a, go down the garbage chute and like just fall into a, a garbage bin. I just like feel funny like that's an extremely questionable head. decision. It is. Absolutely. Because that you die. Like you're going to die for sure. Well, a lot of people don't realize there's a trash compactor at the bottom. Ooh. That gets you. Yeah. Okay. So like PSA guys, no don't matter do that. how drunk you are, don't do that. Um. And, and there's also like the difference of like people going head first versus feet first and like how they got in there. It is like, it does seem like a very difficult thing to do. Right. There was this other lady in, I don't remember what city it was in, um, but she went down a laundry chute at a Delta hotel. Okay. And there was all this speculation and um, they, 
it like went to trial, I guess they like, because it was a hotel, right. It's not like a, a condo or a apartment building. So right. Like people to sue, I guess. Okay. Like, got it. She, yeah. She had like a bunch of drugs in her system too. Um, but they couldn't, and they, the jury had to determine, um, you know, whether it was a, a manner of death. So yeah, not manner versus cause. So manner. So like homicide, accident, suicide. Right. Undertone. Right. And cause being like falling or like yeah. blunt force trauma or whatever. So like who is on a ton of drugs and is like, let me just do some laundry. Well, it's like, what is this little door? Like, let me just go down here. Uh, I don't know. Okay. But I just, I found it interesting because I think in the Phoebe Hanschuk case, it's made to seem like this is like never happened to anyone before. Which, um, and it's it uncommon does seem, for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but apparently it's, it's more common than I ever thought. Wow. It's crazy that it happened so close too in uh, Toronto. Yeah. Hey, did you ever hear anything else about that um, murder that occurred in the building of the person we know? No, not yet. The son murdering the mom. I guess they've been pretty quiet about that in the media. Yes. Well, it's not like sensational. I'm sure they're like building up their case right now. Against yeah, they're him. probably making their case against the guy i i don't know how long that stuff typically takes but hopefully we'll yeah. find out a bit more soon like he's he's young but he's beyond being a minor so it's not like they can or they yeah he's to, an adult yeah and there's been no update from the person we know that lives in that building yeah i'm curious is the building back to normal now no more police crawling around or anything i believe so that's good yeah so okay let's get to our story for today okay which is it's interesting. It's very different um, than okay. our last couple. <laughs> Shout this, out BTK. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> um, but this is the story of Jennifer San Marco. Okay. And Jennifer San Marco went postal. What does that mean? <laughs> I won't tell you. But I'm just going to go and, and tell you that I'm reading this a six out of ten. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I think a lot of people probably will know what the term going postal is, but I will get to it when I get. I've to heard it. it. I just don't know what it means. Yeah. So um, here we go. Let's hear it. So just before the start of the 9 p.m. shift change at the Goleta Postal Facility in Santa Barbara, California. Okay. Ex-postal employee Jennifer San Marco tailgated another car into the parking lot. And that is when her horrible deadly plan began to play out in order to get through the first security gate she tailgated another car into the staff parking lot she parked her truck about 100 feet from the secured employee entrance jennifer held up the first employee she saw at gunpoint and demanded he hand over his security badge oh god and then she let him go and he handed it over yeah he she shoved a gun in his face yeah what's he gonna do Fuck. As she continued along the car park, she came across 37-year-old Z Fairchild and okay. shot her right in the head at close range. Wow. As San Marco continued toward the entrance, she came across 28-year-old Malika Higgins. She walked right up to Malika and shot her dead as well. My God. Right outside the entrance to the building, Jennifer shot and killed 42-year-old Nicola Grant. There were a number of employees in the break room of the building, and they recalled hearing shots being fired. They looked out the window that had a direct view to Jennifer. They didn't witness her shooting anyone at the time, but when she saw them looking at her, she just looked back at them and smiled. Oh, my God. Then Jennifer entered the building with the stolen security badge, and there were about 80 people inside working at the time. The specific building that she entered was a very loud building. Like the floor of the workplace was very loud. Mm -hmm. It contained many big automated machines used to sort mail. A lot of workers recalled hearing gunshots at the time, but at the time they attributed these sounds to the machines or the not uncommon sound of another employee dropping a pallet on the floor. I'm not even sure what exactly a pallet is, but like a big item. I guess. Okay. 
but slowly people started to get it. Jennifer made her way through the floor and shot 44-year-old supervisor Charlotte Colton. One of Charlotte's co-workers dragged her body to the entrance corridor where she was later found by responding officers. Jennifer then made a beeline towards her old workstation where she cornered and shot 52-year-old Lupe Schwartz. Other employees now understood what was happening and a panic began to ensue. Everyone was yelling and alerting each other and running toward the exits. But Dexter Shannon was wearing headphones at the time and he never heard the screaming or Jennifer approaching him from behind. And she Oh my god. At point blank range. After she had killed six of her ex-coworkers, she used the same gun to shoot herself and she was found dead on the ground in the pool of her own blood. The gun had to be pried from her cold, dead hands. Wow. But it wasn't even a full day later that authorities discovered yet another body. Jennifer's ex-neighbor, Beverly Graham, hadn't been seen since the previous day. And when her boyfriend went over to her house to come see her, he stumbled upon her dead body. Oh, that's not good. So neighbors say they heard gunfire sometime between 7.15 and 8.15 p.m. And it was on her way to the postal facility that Jennifer decided to enact revenge on Beverly. Because Beverly had often complained about Jennifer's loud music and her behavior that I will get into later. Um, And they had a history of arguing with each other. So we believe that's why she killed Beverly. The shell casings in Beverly's home matched those in the postal facility. And with Beverly, that brought the number of lives lost that day to eight, if you include Jennifer. Wow. So that's what she did. That's crazy. Yeah, it was a pretty big, I guess, spree killing. Yeah. Which you, so like, you know, there's a difference between, what is the difference between spree killer? It's like a. It's like a school shooting. Like, it's like you go in and you kill a bunch of people in one. Um, like, I've heard of even people saying a murder spree where it's just like I, someone murders somebody and then they go murder somebody else. Like, there's not a quote unquote cooling off period in between. Yes, it's the lack of the cooling off period that makes the difference between a spree and a serial killer. Yes, I just looked it up according to the FBI. Because essentially she did. Yeah, shout out my crime knowledge. But she did. um yeah, yeah. That's you, crazy. So that that's that is so what we're talking about. I I wanna know like why and who she is and what happened. And so she worked at the you said she worked at the postal office. Well, first I'm gonna so tell you a little targeting. bit as just a small history about like what going postal is and like the term going postal. So um Okay. Does it have to do with the post office then? Literally, yes. Okay, that's where okay, like, it, it originates. So on so okay. from this? <laughs> Not from this specific. <laughs> okay, okay. But like she this happened at a postal facility. Yeah, that's like, what, okay. It happens at other places, but like it seems to happen. It weirdly seems to happen a lot at postal places. What's up with postal places? I mean, I guess it's not really a great place to work. It's just like a shitty environment that makes people turn violent. I, I don't know. Let us know if you work at a post office. Yeah. So, okay. So on August 20th, 1986, disgruntled United States postal worker Patrick H. Sherrill reported to work armed with three semi automatic pistols and proceeded to shoot Dear his God. way through the postal facility. He killed 14 employees and wounded six and then killed himself. Now, Patrick was a socially inept loner and he blamed the management for his problems. He had become a small arms expert Sounds while working. Just like a school shooter. Yes. Well, obviously, these are similarities, right? Like, this is the adult version. Yeah. Um, It's just, like, the male version. What the fuck? Yeah. The post office version. Okay. Um, Yeah. So, he he became a small arms expert while working at the Oklahoma Air National Guard. So, that mixed with his seemingly, like, extreme resentment towards his superiors created the deadliest workplace attack by a single gunman in United States history. This that's incredibly sad. Yeah, it's a lot of people. So this incident and it's just created, like 
that your coworkers did nothing to you. Like, or maybe they were dicks to him, but you know, not nothing warrants you going in and murdering exactly. people. Um, but this was the incident that created the term going postal, which is still used today. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know if it's Is like that a offensive. politically correct term. <laughs> That's what I was just to say. I don't know if like, if like, it's like really inappropriate, but it's I like, know. I mean, whatever I could care less, like, not that like, you know, I care about people's feelings and stuff, but like, you know, um, it's it just like, a word. It's fine. But it's, it's just like a thing. Guys, like that seems kind of insensitive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not nice, but like the whole thing is not very nice. Right. Um, yeah but it's 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 generally used to describe like a workplace shooting spree and like lots of people are like oh like hope he doesn't go postal or whatever like that's yeah i guess you have to make light of these things as we like to do um i thought it just meant like going postal is like yeah i don't know what i thought it meant yeah it's literally means you like not this and murder people at a postal facility yeah it's not what I thought it was but Patrick was not the only one so then there was Joseph M. Harris Tomic McIvean Lawrence Jaco and Grant Gallagher so these were all people that happens so often and today we're going to be talking about Jennifer San Marco who seems Uh to be the only woman that I'm aware of who has done this as well um, it does to seem be to be clear, a male be, activity. There are other female spree killers, but Jennifer seems oh, really to be okay. The only female United States postal worker to go postal <laughs> that we know of. That's pretty fucked up that this happens often enough that it's like, yeah, she went postal. Like, this and, just that, and then it happens so much at postal facilities. Like, yeah, not like factories or like and it's happened in a lot of places don't get me wrong um there was one girl who came and like shot up at the youtube headquarters um whoa i don't know if she got anyone i don't i've just like seen her i haven't really looked into her story um that's pretty crazy but this is generally like and i think we we will see it here like this is somebody who generally is going through some like pretty severe mental health crises yeah I think like that that tracks with like school shooters too. Like most of them are so severely depressed and everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's the like adult version. Yeah, Hello. literally. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so there's not there's there is we are missing a lot of like her family life and like we don't mm. know much about her family. But here I'll I'll let you know. I'll, this is what we do know. Okay. So Jennifer San Marco was born December 6th, 1961 in Brooklyn, New York. Now, Brooklyn in the 60s was pretty tumultuous. It, there was a lot of uh, social change. There was striking. There was rising unemployment. And with that, rising crime rates. And then, of course, the civil rights movement took hold. And there were heavy mm-hmm. racial tensions and a lot of riots toward the later end of the 60s. Jennifer apparently played with other kids and had a group of friends but not much is known about her home life and immediate family. In high school, Jennifer was described as somebody who laughed along at things in class and seemed nice, but for the most part was a pretty huge loner. She never mentioned anything about her family and it seemed very deliberate. And as we would later learn, Jennifer seemed to have been acutely aware of the racial issues going on around her. When she was a little bit older, her school and neighborhood would be part of a busing program. And that is where they would bus in Black kids from the inner city to go to school with the white, mostly Italian kids in Jennifer's Brooklyn neighborhood. Now, is she white? Yes, she's white. Okay. I don't know. San Marco, is that an Italian? I don't know if she's Italian. I don't know. I couldn't tell. It's probably like really obvious one way or the other, but if you're Italian, let me know. Um, at the time, a lot of people in the neighborhood did not take this well, and there was a lot of racism and vitriol aimed at these poor kids being bust in. That's super shitty. I don't know exactly where Jennifer fell on the issue, but at a minimum, okay. you know that she was aware of it. She took it in, and like this and all the other civil rights related events that were surely having an impact on her down the road, and we'll see this comes up later. 
She graduated high school in 1978 and went on to attend Rutgers University in New Jersey. I don't know what she was studying there. Um, In 1989, Jennifer made a big move to the West Coast and she got a job as a guard at a medium security prison at Chuckawalla Valley State Prison in Blythe, California, and then quickly moved on to become a police dispatcher in Santa Barbara. And then only a few months later, she left that position and took a temporary teacher's assistant job. Now, we're not sure why all of these big change. Yes, like really um, different jobs. These positions all seem to end very abruptly. We don't know, but it seems like it was. I think it was mostly her um, not fitting the job or doing a very good job. But there's definitely a big pattern of very short lived jobs. Is there any um, interviews or anything from people who hired her at those jobs? Not at those jobs, but there is a lot of um, footage of like people she worked with at the postal facility. And we have like, we hear a lot from them. Okay. That's where we get a lot more information. Interesting. Okay. Um, She also did not seem like she was in contact with any of her family or friends back home. For the most part, she was still a huge loner. And that's like a theme I think that. That's super sad. You'll see. And like. You know, if she had like one friend or like one family member, I think things would have turned out a lot Could have been different. different. And like, I think that's something we see a lot with any, like, I, I mostly know about school shooters. That's obviously a huge topic right now because there's so many of them right now. Um, and it seems like a lot of those people are super socially isolated. It seems like it's a trend. Maybe it's something where, um, Obviously, I can't put myself in their shoes or anything, but maybe it's something where they are kind of just like overall super resentful, isolated, and it's just like their final self-destructive act. Yeah. And I think specifically in this case, it's like she's having like severe mental health issues and there's just nobody to notice or help. Yes. That's it's just like breeding. That's and basically like, like the worst. Growing, right. Yeah. That's there's good. nobody to be like, yo, like you should see someone and like. But even if there was, it's like, it's hard to access mental health care. It is, but somebody to like, you know, and and maybe, maybe even just like somebody to talk to, but yeah, somebody to be aware, like stop her from buying a gun. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good. And it was just, it's pretty easy for her to buy one too. So we'll get there. Yeah. Anyway, Jennifer also Canadian, so. Yeah, we don't don't know anything about that, but there's like, just like you just like can't get guns here. Yeah, I, not I easily even anyway. Know to start. Yeah, but anyway, Jennifer moved multiple times while in California, and in one of the apartments okay. she was a tenant of, Jennifer was neighbors with 54 year old Beverly Graham. Now okay. their units shared a connecting wall. No one quite knows all the details of their relationship, but other neighbors recalled Jennifer and Beverly having heated discussions about Jennifer's loud music. And on at least one occasion, Beverly actually called the police on Jennifer to complain about the noise. These neighbors also reported Damn. that Jennifer used to behave very oddly. They said Jennifer Ooh. used to talk to herself or what appeared to be an imaginary other person. So it's like it is to herself, but it's like she's having a conversation with someone. That's pretty odd. I mean, I kind of do that, to be honest, but not like this exactly exactly yeah um she would walk up and down the street screaming Beatles songs often and it would seem that the complaints yeah yeah the poor Beatles are just associated with the Manson (laughs) yeah like the worst people yeah they're pretty bad though I'm just saying the Beatles or the Mansons uh both you don't like the Beatles no, just John Lennon's like kind of a dick. I don't know oh, about yeah, the rest yeah. of them. No, no, I agree. I, I tend to agree with that. I, I liked a, a lot of the music, but uh, yeah, the music, I guess. But like, yeah, it's just me. Just a little on his high horse at times. <laughs> oh, you're frozen. Yeah, and he was like a white beater and just like an asshole. I didn't. I didn't know John Lennon was a white beater. Did he beat Yoko? Uh, yeah, I think her. Maybe like the wife before him. I forget the details, but he was quite the asshole. And then there was like one child that he just like completely rejected and was like, fuck you. And just like mean to his child while going around being like, oh, I'm all about peace. And like, yeah, it's like, 
I think he has a quote that's like, I'm all about peace because I'm a violent person. And like, I just like, don't want to be that way or something. But like, then don't. Yeah. Just don't do that then. Get off your high horse, bro. Yeah. I don't know. Well, anyway. Yeah. So she, she was blasting Beatles song, like singing Beatles songs very loudly. Okay. Like she, sure. it was described that she was yelling Beatles songs. So, and, you know, she definitely was eccentric at minimum and like mentally unstable at uh at maximum and people were aware of this but like you know no one was like her friend so like everyone was just like okay crazy lady that lives next door whatever um it seemed that the complaints that beverly had about jennifer were pretty reasonable as jennifer was displaying a lot of yeah like she was she was being super loud um so Fair enough. Then in 1997, Jennifer finally got a steady full-time job at the Goleta Goleta mail distribution and processing plant. She bought herself a condo and got settled. Now, ex-employees of the postal site described Jennifer as both bright and cheery and somewhat interactive, but also quite closed off. And some said she seemed to be very intelligent. Although one thing seemed to be clear I couldn't find anybody who worked there who said that they knew her very well or considered her to be a real friend. Right. But the other postal service employees also remember that she began talking to herself or an imaginary friend. And it seemed like the relationship between Jennifer and the imaginary friend would grow very toxic. And the conversations between them started to get angry. It's so weird. Yes. And one guy said that he like he used to say hi to her and like make small talk with her until one day she just started yelling at him and he didn't talk to her after that. And then she started That's coming sad. in with like lipstick smeared all over her face and like super messy. And, you know, the postal facility is like mostly guys. So they're just like, oh, I guess she like missed like they're not taking that as like a sign of severe issues. Yeah. Right. But then eventually it got to the point where she came into work and she would barely say a word to anyone. And in hindsight, I think it was clear that she was displaying some pretty obvious signs of mental illness. Yeah. And everyone was aware, but I guess no one really wanted to get involved. It. She seems like she's not the most um, approachable and like if she's randomly yelling at people, I would be scared to approach her even if I was worried, which is sad because she probably did need help absolutely but it's like yeah you know it's like when nobody's close with her like nobody wants it's like nobody's problem you know yeah that's true which is like the sad part you know yeah 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 and she probably didn't even know that she was having a mental health crisis no well she's like talking to herself or somebody else like clearly right. this, is, this woman has something is not right so one day she came into work and she made a comment about another employee uh, to and she made a comment to another employee about an ex-employee who had recently committed suicide. And I'm not sure exactly what she said, but something about this comment really disturbed the person that she made the comment to. OK. And it prompted him to reach out to his supervisor and tell him that he was concerned about Jennifer. So That's like, very finally, nice. Finally Go someone, you. Someone's giving a shit. Yeah. Um. And when the supervisor tried to talk to Jennifer, a huge yelling argument broke out and authorities had to be called. No, fuck. And she kind of went nuts wow. and tried to get away. Um, and then the cops had to come and it took two officers to restrain her physically. And because of her aggressive outburst, a mental health team had to be called to perform a risk assessment. And they deemed her not safe to be released. Wow. Okay. So, which is you like, actually, correct. people are, this, this to me, like, oh, this is, you're doing something like yeah yeah yeah. good um so they ended up calling a mental health facility and she was committed under a 5150 which is a temporary involuntary psychiatric commitment of a person who presents a threat to themselves or others right do we have anything equivalent to that here you know um i think so yeah i don't know 100 percent, but i think we do have some we do we definitely have involuntary psychiatric hold or maybe it depends on the area i'm not sure yeah we do um yeah. cool, cool. that's good i think yeah. i think 
that should be a thing. It's ne- definitely necessary. Sometimes. It's sad that it has to come to that, but like, some people are a danger to themselves and others. And yeah, oh, for sure. Clearly. <laughs> and we're seeing the outcome of that in this yeah. episode. Um, blah, blah, blah. We, yeah, so we know at this facility that she saw a psychiatrist who performed an evaluation and made a diagnosis and treatment plan. But Jennifer refused to accept any of it. Right. And once the hold was up, they had no choice but to let her leave. So do we know like what she was diagnosed with or anything like that? I don't know what her diagnosis was. Um, It's my assumption that it would be some sort of like schizophrenia. Oh, yeah. Or bipolar. Like she's talking to people that are not there. Right. That's... I'm like no paranoid psych- schizophrenia kind of yeah, thing. I'm no psychiatrist and I no, same, but to guess um, based on my very limited knowledge. Right. Um, that's what I guess. Um, it looks like Jennifer was specifically experiencing psychotic delusions and intrusive thoughts. That's right. what we do know. And she was becoming more and more removed from reality. Oh, God. She was able to return to work after the whole incident, but it was reported that she was completely withdrawn from that point out and continued to talk to herself in an increasingly aggressive manner. And at least this is scary. Yeah. It's like these, like knowing what happened, obviously, but that's really scary. Yeah. Um, and at least one other worker said that she had an outburst at him when he tried to say hi to her one morning. So that's just saying hi to her. Yeah. So in 2003, Jennifer was retired from her job for mental health reasons, and she was asked to leave. So essentially fired, but basically they're like, you are too mentally ill to work here. It's so sad. It's like, I mean, yeah, of course, she she sounds like she is, but it's also like, it's probably going to make her worse when you fire her. But I don't blame them for firing her, but. You know. It's just a bad situation. Yeah. Um, and it's made worse because like she won't accept any help. Yeah, but that's you the thing when make, you're you can't make yeah. Get help. That's the thing. It's like it's true. I agree with you. Like you can't, especially as an adult. But somebody who's mentally ill, a lot of the times, will refuse help because they feel like they either feel like they, um, you know, like they like mentally ill. That or the, exactly, or they're just so far down a self-destructive path where they're just like I can't get better well she seems she seems to like she's she's definitely got some bouts of clarity but like she seems quite Mm. out of it yeah so it's like who knows what she thinks in her own mind right and again no close friends or family so nobody to like ask there's nobody to like who's like I had nobody who's so trusted exactly So in July of that year, Jennifer sold her place and moved to Milan, New Mexico. Wow. And this was like a pretty small town in New Mexico. And in this new town, Jennifer was at first described as quiet and pleasant, but it did not take long for her past behaviors to begin to present themselves. She continued to talk and sing to herself loudly, but she also started buying items at local stores only to walk outside and throw those items directly into nearby garbage bins along with the receipts and the extra cash she had. So like this is like, that is weird. You can't know what you're doing if you're throwing money in the garbage. Right. Definitely. It's not like she had a lot of it. Um, she, went to a gas station that she would frequent often often and she stripped down in front of a bunch of people one day okay so that was another strange situation yeah that's kind of weird and then there was this kind of bizarre thing that happened so in milan there was this little administration office for the town that jennifer would frequent and there was a woman working there named sonia salazar and slowly jennifer began to grow attached to sonia and every time oh. she showed up, uh, she would ask for Sonia. And if she wasn't there, Jennifer would get very agitated. Now, Sonia described Jennifer San Marco as nice to her. But about a year into Jennifer coming in to pay bills and such, she began to change. Ooh. She got more and more agitated and aggressive. And she would refuse to be served by anyone but Sonia. 
And then one day she showed up and it looked like she had just like hacked away at, at her hair. It was all short and patchy. That's a bad sign. It's not good. And now things got super weird when one day Jennifer came into the administration office to apply for a business license. And the business she wanted a license for it was called the Racist Press. She then presented a stack of writings that she wanted published. And there were five volumes titled Racist Press. What were they? So these documents contained a somewhat incoherent conspiracy theory that talked about oh God. <laughs> how the United States government was in cahoots with the KKK to brainwash people into committing racist murders. And there were many claims, okay. including that the government was using psychics and the Rocky Horror Picture Show to achieve its racist goals. Shout out Rocky Horror Picture Show, I guess. <laughs> so it was like, she, Sonia was just like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> what do you like, say when you get that? I don't know what you would do, what someone would do. And this, this five volumes, like this is a lengthy document. Yeah, that takes a lot of work. Now, within the document, Jennifer also God. made mention of David Berkowitz, also known as Son, Son of Sam. Interesting. In her writings. I believe that he was another person that she said the government was brainwashing people through. Mm. And interestingly, David Berkowitz was also a postal worker at one time. Was he? Yes. And Jennifer was living in and around New York in the 70s when he was committing murders and terrorizing the city. Wow. Okay. He was captured in 1977 when Jennifer was 16 years old. And it's so funny, too, because BTK was super into Son of Sam, like this guy. Comes well, he taunted the police. He comes up so much. You know, the, the whole thing about him was how he was the schizophrenic. He was bla- saying that his neighbor's dog was the devil. And that's who was telling him to do all these murders. And then I've heard later that he was like, no, I'm sa- like, I'm sane. I just said that shit. Like, yes. that was just to and make the story more interesting. I'm pretty sure Gary Heidnick also, um, like, because Gary Heidnick uh, made many claims to people about how he would just pretend that he was mentally ill so that he would, could plead insanity. And, like, he said that. Right, right. He saw Son of Maybe Sam it was for that. that. Um, yeah. Like, he's, like, he saw a number of um, of uh, serial killers do that. And yeah, I think it's been been shown that he was pretty, he was fine. Yeah. <laughs> he was a big thing in his childhood was that he was adopted. And that seems to somehow sometimes like really fuck people up sometimes. Yeah. I'm sure if they like don't tell you and you find out and everything's if, a yeah. lie and like Ted Bundy or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so she, he came up a lot in her writings. But and- Jennifer seems like she actually is. I don't know if insane is the right word, but she seems like she's truly not. Well, in her right. Yeah. Mind. And there's like yeah. the legal version of insanity and then there's like mental illness and like personality disorders and right you know if it's part of your personality then it's not considered insanity blah 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 right i think i don't know again yeah not a doctor but anyway in 2005 (laughs) jennifer then bought herself a semi-automatic handgun of her own from a pawn shop for $325. Wow, crazy how you can just do that. The man who owned the shop said that he ran a background check and that nothing concerning came up. And there was a 15-day waiting period. And then she was able to pick up the gun. And okay. she also bought 200 rounds of ammunition. Should now, I also put on her background check that she was in a psychiatric hospital or no? I have no idea. I have no idea. What At one point in time... Were. At one point in time, she was considered such a danger to herself and others that she was put on an involuntary psychiatric hold. I, mean, I feel like I if feel you're like giving somebody you're giving like somebody the responsibility of a gun, which is a big responsibility, I would think. I would, you know, I would tend to agree with you there. I don't know. That seems like a very reasonable thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think it's to me too. Um, and it's unclear to me. You know, like, look, I don't want to get into like the Second Amendment, like it's not anything I know anything about. It's not a, 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 a pool I want to dip my toe into. Yeah. Um, but um, to me, it's like, what's the disconnect here? Like, is it 
that these is it that like these people who are selling the guns don't really want to take a look at the uh at the records or Mm -hmm. is it that the records aren't being like do they not include mental health stuff is it just criminal records yeah is there mental health stuff if not why not like I just have so many questions that I don't want answers to there really really should be it just seems like background checks are like bullshit yeah even for her own safety like even if she's just gonna like even if she's only a danger to herself and not others yeah still relevant the the vast majority I am oh I'm pretty sure of uh gun deaths are suicides it makes sense because it's pretty fucking easy to kill yourself with one I would assume yeah and like if we you know don't want people to be doing that like it makes sense that there's like a little mental health check and you know if you had to undergo a 5150 in the last few years and had to leave your place of work like should that not be like oh hey like maybe you you maybe no yeah and I also read in another source that it was a two-day hold but I think I read in more that it was a 15 day hold. So I'm not sure exactly the length of time. either or. Yeah. But it doesn't really make a difference. I don't know. So, I don't think so. Okay. So not a gun. I think that's pretty scary. Uh, but yes. again, very much, much so. about it. When the police searched her home after the killing spree, they found evidence in her backyard of extensive uh, target practicing. Mm -hmm. Although they couldn't tell how far away she'd been standing from the homemade targets, it's clear that she developed a very good aim. Oh, that's absolutely terrifying. So, and I think that's one of the clues of like, like, was this a bout of clarity? Like, did she you so out of it that you couldn't target practice before you went on your killing spree again like there was no trial because she was dead so right none of this you really got know. sussed out so much yeah um the purchase of the gun and ammunition and then the targeted practice again leads experts to believe that she was suffering some from some pretty severe mental issues but she did she, she was not totally insane she was not like completely out of it and she was able to hatch a pretty elaborate plan that she carried out over multiple weeks right like Ugh. she bought the gun waited for the gun practiced with the gun oh god then like you know knew how to get into the facility had the wherewithal to take a security badge from somebody and not yeah. kill them and then go on to like systematically go through and murder people and beverly on the way too right um yeah, so like it wasn't long after the purchase of the gun that she went on the killing spree, and like it was, she went from Arizona to California, so like it was a pretty long drive, and that's pretty much what we know. We know that since then her family has remained silent, and we know almost nothing about her background. Right. In hindsight, I think, um, I think she was suffering from something pretty intense. I again, I think if I were to guess, I'd say probably schizophrenia, but again, who knows? Um, yeah. Schizophrenia seems to be the one with the voices. Yes, yes, and paranoid delusions. Yeah, exactly. Um, um and I think what is really sad in this case is that Jennifer clearly had no friends or family in her life, nobody to care about her or extremely to, like, sad. Ask her to seek help or um see any of the glaring red flags yeah um like the, you know the person who saw these the most was probably like sonia salazar who was just some like random who was just like worker. you're scary yeah honestly i think that like it's interesting how because again my frame of reference for spree killers for the most part is school shooters and mm-hmm. they don't make it very far in life before they do this you know spree they don't killing. have as, as long a history yeah like she, she sounds like she was a bit of a loner as a kid. And then maybe like, maybe it would have always ended this way for people who were on the same trajectory, but it carried on for so long with her. Like, it's so sad to think that she had to go through her whole life without friends or family or not saying like her whole life, but she was clearly very isolated. Yes. And there was one was- guy who was interviewed like there's there's very little about her there's very little written about her there's very little videos about her that's kind of why I decided to 
to do her because I I haven't heard about her so um I I thought it would be interesting yeah I thought it would be kind of unknown but also it was like kind of difficult to research and like I didn't find that much information so this will kind of be a shorter episode it's it's still it's still a lot in a sense like her her history her mental health a lot there Yeah. yeah Um, but there was one guy who went to high school with her who was like, I had kind of had a little crush on her and like, wow. Whatever. Um, but like, she didn't, it seemed like she didn't really like notice that he did that. And, but like, and he thought she seemed like a really nice person, but there definitely seemed to be something up with the family. Like, and I don't know if like, maybe, yeah, there was any history of abuse or neglect or anything. She never talked about them, but she like purposely really distanced herself from her family. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't think it's right to, like, accuse people of things with no evidence. So who... Not abuse necessarily, knows? but chances are there's something, like, why would she push herself away from her family if they were, you know... Nice to her. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And yeah. a lot of times with schizophrenia, which I don't know if that is or isn't what she had, but, it, you know, symptom-based, it sounds like she could be diagnosed with something like schizophrenia. A lot of times that can be triggered. Like it, a lot of people can have the predisposition for it, but then if you undergo a trauma, it can be specifically triggered. Like maybe if she had siblings, maybe not all of them turned out the way that obviously that she did. We'd probably know if they did, but yeah. maybe she experienced some type of trauma or she just grew up in a dysfunctional household and she was the only one with the predisposition, you know? Yeah, it's impossible to say, and there's so many possibilities. Yeah, it's true. But it just, I think to me, this is such a cautionary tale of like why it's important to like check in with people. Yeah. That you don't, you know, maybe you you think something's going on or. Like sooner, sooner than later, because like even if you notice somebody you know withdrawing but it, it's hard it is really really hard because even like i think about obviously like my own mental ups and downs which have never ever been like nearly to this level obviously but it can be hard if somebody's like hey are you okay you just are like yeah i'm fine like you know it's hard yeah. to yeah no and need, i don't there definitely needs to be like like mental health care should just be like part of you know like it should just be like freely offered and easily yeah. accessible it's interesting. Chris just got a doctor. Like he's like never nice. had a doctor before, and uh, she's <laughs> cool. he, he like went and was like, "Is he a murderer though?" The doc? No, it's a woman. Uh, I don't know. If she's a murderer. Like, who knows? Maybe <laughs> it's possible. Um, it's definitely possible. But he was like, he went in to meet her, and he's like, "What? What do I come here for? Like, what is this service?" <laughs> she's like. <laughs> <laughs> health (laughs) she's like well honestly mostly it's mental health these days mostly people come for like mental health reasons yeah that's Um, a sign of the times for sure yeah which i found very interesting it is interesting and it really really should be more accessible and but it's like what is very common now about like i guess like refer you yeah refer um he's like oh you'll never see me then (laughs) (laughs) okay bye uh yeah it's yeah it's it's scary and it's it's scary like I remember um there was like a friend somebody there was a person who was like a friend of somebody else and I'm just gonna be very vague about this so that it doesn't get turned into anything but like okay and tell me after yeah yeah um I think it was was like a middle school acquaintance of oh okay okay. who um like I had met before whatever and like and this has happened to actually a number of people like people there was somebody from there's somebody from our high school who this happened to as well and like okay this, when facebook was really big and like people were just like always posting yeah um, statuses and stuff right i like barely remember facebook now um but like you would you could just see people's like mental health declining and then being like i have no friends like I have I'm having issues I've never seen that but that is I've seen it happen to a number of people that's concerning Um, and there was this one girl who like you could see through her Facebook status updates I guess was what it was Mm -hmm. like her having some sort of like mental breakdown and her that's really scary and like accusing somebody of assaulting her and then calling out specific people from high school saying like weird things and like apologizing for things in our high school this was yes 
Um, I don't recall. And it was like, there was a couple people being like, Hey, like we were friends. Like, are you okay? Like something, something doesn't seem right here. Yeah. That's really scary. Cause it's like, maybe and it's, it sounds maybe like a cry you were assaulted and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Um, oh God. So, and I think it, it just like, it breeds under circumstances of loneliness. Yeah. That is really like, if there's one lesson I've learned in the past few years of like lockdown, it's like isolation is really bad. <laughs> like, yes, yes. It's really, really bad mentally, physically, everything. Like, it's just not good. Yeah. At my midwife office in the bathroom, there's like all these signs on the back of the door. So, um, and it's like, isolation has been really bad. Like, are you having suffering from domestic abuse and both like there's so many that's different, so like, nice helplines and whatever but it's like that is what people you know? need especially if you're yeah, like in lockdown is. like pregnant like maybe you're oh my god impregnated you is like beating you like fuck yeah it's scary mm-hmm. anyway that's that's the story of jennifer san marco um, that's super interesting it really is like it's like the person who's kind of like like you think they're they're kind of strange because they keep to themselves and they don't try and socialize that's a person that a like we should be careful about selling guns to but also like they definitely need help and it sucks that it's really hard to get it and usually by the time there's really noticeable signs they're in a state of mind to refuse help too yeah, and that's the problem too. Is like you know they tried to help her, but she you you can't make somebody. Yeah, what can get you help. do? So I don't know how you how you solve this problem exactly. How, how you and I guess that's the big thing right now with like you know gun control ag, uh, advocates and you know if she if she weren't able to get the gun that easily, would this have been stopped or like? That's interesting. I mean, I'm I wonder, sure she still would have har- Like, I feel like she still would have caused harm in some way um well it's just like would she have been able to get her hands she on wouldn't have probably gun? been able to yeah yeah and she probably wouldn't have been able to do maybe as much damage i don't know i have no idea and like that's an empirical question you know that definitely has an answer to i just don't have it um but it definitely it definitely does seem like it was a little too easy for her to get a gun yeah it's too easy to get guns sorry we're so. canadian we have a super like we have a Canadian perspective. Like it's very yeah. different here. You can't it is. just go to a pawn shop and get a gun here. Like you literally, it's really, really hard to get a gun here. And we're all fine, man. Yeah. We're chilling. The only people I know with guns are people who hunt. Same. Like my brother. <laughs> he has a shotgun. Yeah. It's and like massive. They're actually in Toronto, like there seems to be like there's more, there's more and more illegal guns coming in often legal or illegal illegal and those are the scary ones because like you don't know who has them yeah they're all kind of scary i actually know a lot of people who've had their hands on guns uh who their youth Uh oh and their youth nobody nobody that i'll mention here Um, no no but like people i know probably oh wow if you're if you're like in a gang like you can get guns yeah yeah or like if you're like selling drugs or whatever like anyone i know who had a gun like was like a drug dealer yeah. Not that I know drug dealers or buy drugs. So it is, do, it, so it is, it is, it is like p- quite easy to get your hands on a gun here if you're, uh, yeah, if, if you know if people. Doing it illegally. Yeah. But I feel like the like isolated person who doesn't have any social network of people around them. Yeah. It might still be hard. And I feel like, you can't I feel go like to a store. this is terrible, but I feel like if she w- went to like go get an illegal gun, like the person would be like, no. Yeah, yeah. Like they would have the sense to be like, I don't know. I don't, think, I don't so. think you should have it. You're having arguments with your imaginary friend. It just seems like a bad not, call. Not a good idea. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's like a very timely topic, and definitely not trying to make light of any of it because it's no. it is very uh, horrific. Um, yeah, it's like the gut, like gun control. Yes, definitely. But to me, it's like. It like more about mental health to an yeah. extent, you know. I agree. That's, that's really like your like Chris's doctor said. Like that's the number one reason people are going to doctors now, and which is crazy amidst a pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I don't know, but like even for me, like I would, I feel like 
I just feel like everybody should probably be in therapy or have some type of mental health, like support. Like, I feel like that's, that's just something that everybody needs. And like, I'm like, how do I, like, I'm not in therapy. Like, how would I get a therapist? How would I find one? How would I afford it? Like, and I'm like, not, and I'm not like somebody in a crisis, you know what I mean? So like, I'm just like your average person. And you just want it for like maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's not accessible. Like not saying that it's not accessible, but like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not like, it's not covered. Yeah, definitely. And it doesn't seem like it's something that's like, like I've been to therapy before and like, I didn't really vibe with my therapist. So I'm like, okay, what do I do? Like, (laughs) how do you find one that you like, or how do you find the right type of help? Like, it's not, I don't think the infrastructure is quite there yet. Yeah. All my friends who have therapists like love it. And it seems like such a, like a, yeah, I want to go. It's like such a bougie (laughs) It is. It's just somebody to complain yeah, to. But but it is like sorry, one second. Still. All right, there we go. It is like to in in like at the absolute minimum, it is somebody to complain to, but it's still like, you know, I still think that like people need mental health support. Yeah. And I think that is really important. I think it's really, that's not what it is. And it shouldn't be that it's like, like I did, I did cognitive behavioral therapy one time for my needle. Right. And it was, it was, uh, I was not ready for it because I, I thought that I could just go in there and be like, solve my problems, but it's really, it's like somebody helping you solve your own problems. And like, that's not easy to do. No. And I think like, even, even people who grow up in relatively normal childhoods can still have like mental health issues to overcome. And especially I, people who grow up in dysfunctional childhoods, like, yeah, I think need that help. I grew up in a very non-dysfunctional family situation, right? Very minimal to zero traumas in my life, knocking on wood there. But I still feel like, like, mentally I am just like all over the place and like sometimes I feel like a very mentally healthy person sometimes I do not yeah but I think that's like it would be nice to have somebody to help me sort it out a little bit yeah yeah I think we should all have that yeah I wish I wish that for 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 you and for all of you thank you well you can complain to me Madison I don't (laughs) mind yeah I just don't know how helpful that is (laughs) (laughs) I don't know sometimes it's just good to like no, but it's true. It Having out. somebody to talk to is like the bare minimum. And Jennifer yeah. Marco had nobody to talk to. That's exactly. Before. So it's like, it's almost no wonder, you know, in a sense yeah. that she went off when that she, uh, what's the term? Uh, she went postal. Went postal. Yes. Yeah. Hit us up if so that's like, if we're not supposed to be saying that anymore. That seems super fucked up. Yeah. Maybe, maybe like I'll get canceled for this, but I didn't know. So blame it on me being too old. Anyway. If you guys have any feedback or if you have any extra information about this case, something that I didn't find, I would love to know if anyone knows anything about this woman's background. Um, I would love to know. Um, reach out to us at Who's Knocking Podcast on Instagram, at Who's Knocking Pod on Twitter. I started a TikTok. I put out some videos. Did you now? I have three followers. My friend, I actually- you did. Friend. I didn't know about this. Yeah, I started. I just put some of our like, trailers okay okay um but I would like to start doing I'm gonna have a baby soon really soon and I'm like like any second now to be honest yeah. I feel like I want to start doing I want to start doing some like little tiny videos because of the baby no god no <laughs> it's such an inappropriate place to be putting your baby yeah no just like little things going on like in case I don't know I don't know I don't know what me having a baby is gonna do to this I'm hoping to just power through but we'll see yeah we'll see. um yeah my friend has started a tiktok and she's has like a million views on her video there. yeah and you just basically like talk you just say something for like 30 seconds i think there's a three minute maximum okay that's time we're sounding like such boomers right now <laughs> no idea <laughs> i cannot figure out tiktok it's so like it's so much that's why i don't want to be on it it's just the user like experience is just like really in your face i feel but- like it just like well, no, I shouldn't say this because you want to be on it. And I, I encourage you to yeah. have our TikTok, but I feel like it like gives you ADD. Like, I feel like it's just like, it teaches you to not be able to, like it, it hypnotizes your mind to not be able to focus on something. Yes, but like, I, 
I already have that. I'm like really bad at focusing. Really All right. Bad. Well, that's fine so, then. Can't get any worse. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we all, yeah, I, said, I think I said what's the, wait, what's the TikTok at? Who's knocking podcast? I think. Okay. Um, Check us out. It's getting, it's getting lit up on, on uh, TikTok. Um, yeah. And our email address is hello at who's knocking podcast.com. And we're actually, we're reaching two milestones, which is pretty cool. We have 300 followers on Instagram as of today. We actually really went a little bit over that. And we have 149 subscribers on YouTube. So is that a milestone? Like hoping to, oh, well, I'm hoping to hit 150. But yeah. Just, follow, subscribe. Today, so like one more, one person, please subscribe so that. The YouTube is kind of better. Like podcast is good if you're like in the car and stuff, unless you're like me and you like to watch things in the car. Oh my God, don't even say that you do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so concerning. It stresses <laughs> you out so much. <laughs> I like have to keep bringing it up to get a reaction from you. Okay. Um, yeah. Another in me. Yeah, thank um, you. but yeah, no, I like YouTube too. I'm like always on YouTube. I love the long form content. Yeah, but anyway, reach out to us. That's the story for today. Please stay safe out there because you never know who's knocking. This podcast is produced in collaboration with Lost Line Media. Artwork by August Digital. Music by Matthew Cook.